Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great that so many people can be here at 9 o'clock in the morning or a few minutes past. I'm your chairman, so my name is Philip Lewis, and uh, I'm from Vasa ETT. We're a global energy think tank, for those of you that don't know us. And uh, we try to bring together knowledge and expertise in, in the area of uh, um, smart metering, demand response, energy efficiency, and, and other consumer-related issues uh, and marketing-related issues here. And uh, I think this morning we've got a very important session indeed. You know, I must admit, I've been at this conference for around about, I think it is 12 years, or all except the very first one that they had. And I must admit that pretty much over the last eight to 10 years, we've still been discussing whether we actually need smart meters or not. And of course, many countries have progressed to having smart meters. And some countries are still in the process of discussing that. And in some countries, we have certain companies that are more positive than others towards that, and some indeed that may actually roll it out, and some that might not. And uh, Denmark, for example, being a case of that. And, uh, but we have a few key issues that we want to discuss in this session. We want to, first of all, sort of recap, in a way, on what the benefits are of smart meters what, those, what we can actually achieve from smart meters, how we can achieve it in a cost-effective way, where smart meters are taking us, and how we can use smart meters as a platform for going further. And very much what we're looking at here, in many cases, is the customer's point of view. Where does the customer actually fit into this? What do they want out of it? It's not so much a case of figuring the, the sort of the theory of what a customer can get, but how do we actually give them realistically something that they will want in a form that they will want it at a price that they're willing to pay for that thing. So we've got a number of very interesting presentations and quite a diverse set of points of view here, including regulatory views and consumer views um, put into that. So I'd like to introduce uh, my first speaker in a moment, but I'd just actually make two points. One is that because we're very tight on time, we've got a number of presentations, we would love to have more questions. And we have a Q&A session at the end of this morning but until then, after each presentation, if we have time, I'll try to let, give one question to the audience. That's all I'm allowed to give, really, with the time allowing. Um, but actually, well, there'll be one question for each, for each presenter. But we have more time, as I mentioned, at the end of all of this. So I'd like to welcome, then, our first presenter. And uh, I'm always bad at pronouncing Dutch uh, or uh, names, but Hans de Heer, and uh, service line leader, leader for Kiema. And we're looking at quantification here of the costs and benefits of smart grids. So t going beyond just smart meters and looking at the costs and benefits of smart grids that feed on from that. Great. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. Um, Yes, it's, it's a pleasure to me uh, to, to present at this, uh, this conference. Like Philip, I have attended a lot of um, smart metering, smart grid uh, conferences over the past years. And um, it, it seems to be expanding every year. And uh, I think for smart metering, uh, there have been many studies on, on cost-benefit analysis, many proved to be positive. I think it's quite a mature market already. But looking beyond smart metering at smart grids, um, it somehow amazes me on one side there's a lot of attention, a lot of um, companies are making investments, uh, but on the other hand we don't see a, um, a smart grid in operation yet. Um, so the question is why? And um, maybe this is because there is not a um, solid business case yet, maybe there is not a, a viable business model yet. Um, well, those are the topics um, I would like to address in my presentation. Um, just a few words on, the, on, on my company. Um, I think the brochure states that I am representing Kima, but early this year we have merged into the DNV group, um, which is a company headquartered in, in, uh, in Norway uh, with over 10,000 employees. Um, focusing, uh, as you can see, uh, on, on business assurance, uh, maritime, and uh, the energy and sustainability. Um, 
The DNV Kima company is offering um, uh, consulting and testing services uh, to the whole value chain. Um, and we are, uh, our business line is headquartered uh, here in the Netherlands. Um, in the meantime, I, I will try to, <laughs> I have some problems reading the, I must say, the, the computer from over here. Um, so it forces me to look back, which is, I think, a bad uh, presentation style. But um, I'll try to do by heart as much as possible. Um, so this is the, uh, my, my, my presentation, the content of my presentation. First, I would like to um, look at a case study uh, we have performed um, recently, this year. We've, we finished this year for the Netherlands. Um, then I would like to take a closer look at the methodology that we have applied. Um, and I would like to end up with some thoughts about where is the smart grid? Uh, why isn't it happening yet? Or maybe it is happening already. So to start off with um, uh, the, the case study. So um, we have performed a societal smart grid cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I often use the CBA acronym uh, for the cost-benefit analysis. Um, we performed the study by order of the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs, um, and we performed it together with CE Delft. Um, the main question that we have addressed uh, is whether it is uh, feasible to have a large-scale implementation of smart grids in the Netherlands. Um, Again, I want to stress this. This goes beyond smart metering. Uh, of course, we already have finished the smart metering cost-benefit analysis. And I think smart metering is um, um, well, a relatively small part of the total smart grid concept. Um, now, looking at the main prerequisites, um, typically in a cost-benefit analysis, you would compare a what we call a zero alternative with a reference alternative where you would include the, the subject of your uh, study. So um, the reference alternative would include a, a large deployment of a smart grid. Uh, the zero alternative would not. However, you cannot in a societal cost-benefit analysis simply state that in the zero alternative nothing happens because of course that's not reality. Especially since we are looking towards 2050 we have to take into account that the, uh, the, the energy market and the, and the environment will be changing anyhow. So in that respect, um, for example, we considered smart metering as part of the zero alternative because this is already happening, especially uh, we're looking at the Netherlands. This has already been decided. And by 2020, we will have a minimum of 80% coverage of smart metering. So this is not what we will be studying. Uh, another example is um, uh, substation automation. Also something that will happen autonomously if there is a positive business case for the DNO. He will um, uh, work on substation automation. He will improve his grid efficiency using IT. And this is a normal um, evolution of the, uh, of the uh, total energy chain. So what we are considering um, and this boils down, I believe, to the large-scale deployment of the site management. That is really the core of the study that we have performed. Um, so the timeline is uh, the, the deployment of the rollout will start 2050, uh, 15 until 2040, and the total um, uh, the, so the total time horizon stretches towards 2050. Um, so looking on the cost sides, um, the, the figures in blue that's that's already present. There's already um, there are already IT systems with uh, DNOs, TSOs, uh, energy companies. There's already smart meter infrastructure. Um, there are already home appliances, distributed generation. On top of this uh, infrastructure, there will be an additional IT infrastructure that is um, really uh, deploying or implementing uh, the demand side management. Um, so there will be local control and monitoring within dwellings, within industry, within uh, the end users. 
There will be um, central units uh, uh, optimizing this. Um, so a lot of distributed intelligence, and of course there will be some central intelligence as well. Um, and so the, the the red area that is what is um, additional to the current system, and within the reference alternative, these are the elements that uh, the, that we take the cost for into account. Um, for example, uh, distributed generation, uh, we assume that there will be a photovoltaic uh, to, to a larger extent in the future. We do not take into account the cost of that, neither the benefits. But we take into account what are the costs if you would, in an intelligent way, optimize the use um, and optimize load patterns um, and the use of installations and uh, applications. Now, since we do not take into effect the cost of smart metering, we also do not take into account the direct benefits of smart metering. And uh, this, this is only fair, of course. So uh, we typically look at additional benefits that can be derived from a uh, large deployment of uh, demand site management. Now, this, this comparison between the base and the reference alternative, we apply to um, several scenarios, in this case, uh, three scenarios. And those scenarios are in, in intentionally quite extreme scenarios to, to point out the, the, the real effects of the site management. Um, so one, also in, in a sense, an extreme scenario is the business as usual, where we uh, assume that the... Um, uh, for, for example, the energy mix will not change dramatically. So this is mainly based on uh, gas and coal-fired uh, plants. Um, there is a high power demand. Um, there is um, little to no electric mobility. Uh, a low penetration of heat pumps. Low distributed capacity. Um, and Within the system, we have a lot of generation flexibility, uh, as we have now. Um, so the second scenario is, um, and, and so the first is a, is a high carbon uh, society. The second is a, a zero carbon society, where um, uh, generation is, is mainly renewables and gas, and, and, and gas it does not sound carbon free, but that's either biogas or it's, uh, uh, carbon capture storage. Um, so there are, um, it's, it's a high uh, penetration of distributed um, capacity, so um, photovoltaic, uh, for example. Um, so there is gas fired, a lot of biomass, um, a lot of offshore wind. Um, there is still a high generation flexibility because there's also. Um, a lot of storage here uh, included. So the um, flexibility is not only generation, but this includes uh, storage as well. Um, now the third uh, scenario that we considered is um, again a, a zero uh, carbon society uh, based on coal, CCS and nuclear um, with a high penetration of electric mobility, uh, but also a high penetration of uh, heat pumps uh, low um, distributed generation um, and uh, here we also include um, a large hydrogen production for transport. <coughs> the idea behind the hydrogen of course is because you have a lot of base load or must runs you can uh, generate the hydrogen during the night uh, hours. <coughs> So the main costs and benefits, um, well on the cost side, I don't think that that will surprise you. We see mainly the, the IT components, so the hardware, the software, and the communication infrastructure, um, the sensors, actuators, um, that will all be part, of course, of um, well, the demand side management operation. Um, the, the benefits, um, and I will um, talk about them in more detail. Uh, first is the avoided grid investments by um, um, by peak shaving. Of course, you can uh, decrease the, the maximum capacity noted in, uh, needed in, in the grid on, 
either on a high voltage, medium voltage, or low voltage level. Uh, so there you can avoid or um, uh, defer grid investments. Uh, also, avoided grid losses uh, are taken into account. Uh, if you use the, um, um, distributed energy locally, then uh, of course you have uh, less uh, grid losses. Um, again, by reducing peak capacity, you can avoid investments in, uh, in central production units. Um, in the um, uh, renewable and gas scenario, there's also the, we also include storage, and by applying the site management, you can decrease the need for, for storage. Um, there's a more efficient use of central production units. Um, also, there is the element of energy uh, efficiency, energy conservation. This is on top of the energy conservation projected by smart metering. Um, it's partly due to direct feedback to the end user because in the cost-benefit analysis, at least for the Netherlands for smart metering, we only considered indirect feedback. Um, but also literature shows that by applying demand response schemes, there's also a, a energy efficiency effect because by um, delaying energy consumption, sometimes this, le this leads to the, uh, avoiding uh, the energy consumption. And finally, we take into account the contribution to the um, imbalance uh, markets. Okay, so these are the, the results. Um, well, actually, the first table is not a result, but it's the input for our model, where we um, consider the, the amount of flexibility within the system. This is based on, uh, on literature, and there's both an energy savings effect that has been quantified here, but also the, um, um, well, actually the measure for flexibility, um, both when applying time of use and when applying critical peak pricing. Then the outcome of uh, this study uh, for the three scenarios uh, turned out, um, well, rather positive, as you can see. Um, of course, there are uh, high investment needed, but um, the benefits are far larger giving quite positive um, internal interest rates. And what's also, um, well, I think, surprising, well, also to us it was surprising, that also in the business-as-usual scenario, where there is um, little, uh, there are little renewables, little, little inter uh, intermittency, uh, which seem to be the drivers uh, for, for smart grids, uh, there's even a positive business case. Um, so on the, um, uh, the division, uh, the distribution effects of cost and benefits, um, what you see here, there are quite some figures, but um, what you can see here is that um, primarily looking at where cost and benefits uh, are, are distributed, it means that the end user will have to make investments because there will be local intelligence, hardware, software. Um, and the benefits for the end user do not, uh, uh, they, are, they are less than their costs. Where on the other hand, the grid company, energy company, uh, can make uh, large profits. Um, of course, um, in this sense, this, this will not work because every stakeholder, of course, will need to um, uh, profit from um, uh, from from the smart grid, therefore, and I think this is this is logical. There, there needs to be uh, some uh, some money flows from the, the the companies that are in the end um, uh, have the benefits from the smart grid towards the the ones that are offering their flexibility. Um, so this means that the um, energy suppliers will have to share one of some of their benefits that they gain from. Uh, deploying the flexibility of the end user by offering better energy service, uh, energy supply contracts. But also the grid companies will have to include that in their tariff system that also the uh, end user will benefit from uh, participating in well, capacity management. So in, in the end, the figures, you see the total figures, it, it seems like we can make a lot of money, but of course you all know that the energy transition will cost a lot of money 
So it's better be seen as a, a way to reduce the additional uh, money. Okay, Philip, how much time uh, do I have? A couple of minutes, okay. Um, well, then I will briefly skip uh, through the R methodology because that uh, will not, uh, I will not manage it in a few minutes. Um, let me state that we are looking basically at the, um, uh, as I said, the effects on generation by lowering peak capacity and also a transmission distribution by avoiding grid investments. But as you've seen, there are other benefits we take into account. Um, we take a system approach because the main benefits are achieved on system level. But of course, the end user will have to participate. So in the end, the value is realized on bottom level. Um, and we believe the only way to really um, uh, quantify this is to have a full bottom-up approach. So what we do, we take, uh, we take load patterns, we take um, um, the, um, the layout of the grid. Basically, we have modeled the whole Dutch energy system, both the energy market, the energy consumption, and the energy grid. Um, and we have considered what do load patterns and the, 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 the accumulated, aggregated load patterns look like with or without the demand response schemes. And what does it mean for the, um, the energy prices and in the end the cost of the total system and the, the investment needed. So therefore we have applied a, um, a pyramid where we look at, at profiles. These can be either uh, deterministic or based on, on weather conditions. And we have modeled the full year. And we are looking in the end at uh, on the lowest level on hourly based uh, consumption and generation patterns. Um, we look at different user segments, commercial, industrial, domestic, uh, etc. We look at network characteristics because, of course, it uh, generate the, the, let's say, distributed generation and central generation. They have quite a different impact on the full system. And on the highest level, we also look at, at the merit orders of the central production units. This is a typical um, effect you will see. Of course, the, the, the peak uh, peaks are, are shaven. This is. Not surprisingly, um, this is the fact you would uh, you want to achieve. But what I would like to stress is that we are able to quantify the effects in an economic sense of this um, behavior based on the expected market prices of uh, not of today but of 2020 until 2050. So this is my uh, final slide. Um, so there is quite a, a positive business case. And so why isn't there a large scale deployment yet? Well, those are, um, there are a lot of um, reasons. Um, and uh, I've listed them here in, in those three um, um, uh, items. Um, First, of course, especially within dwellings, there is little flexibility available yet. Uh, electric um, vehicles, uh, heat pumps, they are very well suited in the demand side management schemes, but they are not there yet. Um, also, penetration degree of intermittent distributed resources, especially in the Netherlands, is rather limited. Um, on a technical side, of course, a lot of interoperability issues uh, are still present. Um, and there are a lot of practical restraints. Of course, this is, I mean, this is a theoretical model. If you, uh, if you start working in, in, in field trials on smart grids, you will notice that there are a lot of uh, problems you have to uh, face and solve. And um, on the policy side, there's the distribution effects of cost and benefits. And that's, of course, a major issue because you have to change tariff schemes to make this uh, happen. Um, also, there is a status quo in the current market um, and uh, that that will change, so that that has its effects. Um, skipping to the markets, of course, customer involvement. I mean, um, I think every presentation will include uh, customer involvement. Here, it's necessary. It's also difficult because it's basically a system optimization. So, how can you explain to the customer that he uh, needs to um, be involved in the system opt optimization? 
especially when the system is rather complex. Um, final one, the local capacity markets. We have to ensure that we do uh, the capacity optimization. Therefore, um, that has to be incentivized, monetized, and therefore um, capacity markets, local capacity markets are needed. So this uh, will end my uh, presentation. Um, I think there's time for one question, but if you have any other questions, we are here at the exhibition floor as well, and I'm happy to take any other questions uh, at our booth. Actually, I think we'll leave the questions to the end because we're right, but we'll have okay. a Q&A session. So Fine. thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. So save your questions up to the